Hello there, I'm Miranda Gretton and this is Take a Moment with NCHC, the show where we talk to you and your colleagues about experiences that affect you. Listen on your drive between patients or in your downtime, whenever you get the chance to take a moment. Hi, my name is Mercy. I am the EDI advisor for the Trust. Hi, Mercy. It's just you and me today on this one and it's a big one. So I hope you're ready. We are going to talk today about incivility and rudeness. And you literally just said to me before we started recording, I can't bear rudeness. I was like, well, then we're in the right place to talk about it. And I agree with you. Right. So let's think about in, that word incivility. What What is incivility? And I've got a few examples. So you might think it is just rudeness or, or anger, but it goes beyond that. Things like hostility, tutting, gossiping, belittling, criticism, blunt emails or phone calls, being interrupted. And all of these things are things that would make you feel pretty horrible if they happen to you. But in our profession, in the NHS, if that happens to you, sometimes it can have such a knock-on effect that it it affects the patients as well. So we're going to talk today about how incivility can make you feel, because I was really interested to read that it can make you feel differently in the moment to maybe a couple of days later. Also, your bandwidth, and and by that I mean the sort of what we are able to deal with on a daily basis and how that is affected by incivility. And also then people who are onlookers to incivility. What happens if you see it and you don't necessarily get involved, but how does that affect your day? So let's start. Have you ever experienced any kind of incivility or rudeness in the workplace? Oh, my goodness. Yes. (laughs) yeah. Tell me about an example. How oh, did it make you goodness. feel? Sadly, I think in every single job I've ever had, yeah, people seem to be super busy and not in the slightest bit helpful. Um, and this is in a variety of sectors. I haven't always worked for the NHS or within the health sector. I put it down to people being human. We are human. And unfortunately, we're not always able to manage our emotions. We're not always able to manage stress. And this is no matter what level within an organisation we are. It doesn't matter how experienced a person, a colleague may be. We're all different and we all manage stress, anxiety, just a demanding workload differently. It gets to us. And we do need to accept our fallibility. However, I do feel like when we are the person that creates in civil environments, if we make other people feel othered or if we are the person that is othered, we do today in this big 2022, we're in this whole brand new millennia and after a pandemic, we now need to move forward in our thinking and start apologising. We need to accept the fact that we have done something wrong. We've made people feel bad, feel othered. And if we are the person that feels othered, we need to say, like, don't treat me like that. We can't treat people like this. As difficult as it is, because it's so shocking when someone makes you feel like this or makes or makes you feel othered it's sometimes really shocking and you don't know what to do in the moment so if you can't do it in the moment to do it later on when emotions have calmed and there's less tension is sometimes better than to do it in the moment but um yes I have experienced it and I expect to experience it again because like I say we're human and I can't even say it's anything to do with race to do with gender age or anything it's just the way that we each handle situations and sadly we we tend to handle things badly quite a lot of the time well that's it isn't it and I think I think a lot of the time we handle it badly because like we said at the beginning we're busy but everybody is busy so when you're busy and you're in the moment and you're absorbed in a task and someone comes to you and says can you just help me with this or can you just do this and it's you know you might have had a bad morning something might have happened and you might just snap at that person and while that's not acceptable playing devil's advocate you know it's not always easy to moderate Mm. your language in that moment when you are focused on something else especially in the NHS let's say you're focused on a patient 
and someone comes and asks you a question and you you can't lift your head out of that moment long enough to think oh I need to be kind so I'm just going to turn and say oh can you give me a minute so you don't you snap and you go can you just give me a minute and that reaction is I can understand that we've all been there we've all felt that so I suppose what you're saying is you don't have to necessarily moderate it obviously do if you can but if you can't you could a minute or two later think I probably shouldn't have spoken to that person like that and you can find that person and you can apologize and I think that's what's lacking there was a there's a great TED talk that I'm going to link to in the in the podcast that we both watched before this and in that they talk about how mild and moderate rudeness that's what we're talking about here we're not necessarily talking about yelling and screaming that's another level this is mild and moderate rudeness and it can make you feel in the moment belittled ashamed humiliated powerless and in some ways like a child and it's only over time that those feelings kind of that you can understand it you know those feelings develop into a sort of how dare they speak to me like that that sort of anger and that's really interesting to me you would think that when someone snapped at you in that instance you'd just be really cross but actually it's deeper than that you feel you know that that word belittled really sat with me because we've all felt that and it gives you that sort of prickling sensation on your skin and for the rest of the day you struggle to to shake that feeling off and so imagine what that does to the rest of your day. Imagine how that would affect your work. And we've got statistics, haven't we? Your bandwidth, as it were, so the things that you can deal with, reduces by 61% after mild and moderate rudeness. And you carry it with you for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the NHS, that could have devastating consequences. Mm. That's patient um, safety. That's patient right safety. There. Yeah. yeah, that's patient safety right there. But let's talk about it from a slightly different um, <laughs> angle, because we know that if you're treating a patient, you know, it will affect how you do that. And that could be catastrophic. But if you're, say, an admin person, or you mm -hmm. work in support services, you know, would it have that big an effect on you? Oh, my God, 100 percent. Everything that we do supports the work of our clinical professionals. Yes, we work with paper, with computers. At the end of the day, we're all healthcare professionals working to support the clinical team, no matter what our role is. And everything that we do has a knock-on effect for them and everything that they do has a knock-on effect for us. So if a consultant, for example, or any other clinical member of staff, it could be a HCA, it could be a nurse, a doctor, whomever, um, speaks to the person on the ward clerk who is meeting patients as they come into that specific department, if they speak to them rudely, and even in front of other people also, um, those other people could also be patients. And then they've got to go on and finish their job and support that patient, support the team and read the notes and do everything else they have to do in reception. And someone who is more senior to them, who has so much um, gravitas, shall I say, within that department, is rude to them. It's scary. It can be really scary. And it could be something very minute and actually isn't really directed to them but because they're on the desk they have had to take it and eat it all up and it soaks in one rude thing that has been said to me it hurts me it bruises me and because I've been affected and my body hasn't understood what to do with that information just yet somebody asked me a question and I'm like oh can you hang on a minute and I say it too quickly and it, and it sounds like I'm snapping at them because my brain has just been bruised, my heart has been bruised, and I don't know what to do, because I can't think straight. And it literally doesn't stop, because all of a sudden, you're then scared to speak to that person. Exactly. And, and it makes you feel like it must be you. It must, it be, must something be me. That you have done. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, like, did, did I say something wrong? I only asked for help. Or did I ask really rudely? You know, like, oh, and the knock on effect of that is, will you ask for help again? Probably not. Probably not. And then you'll make and a mistake and then you'll get yelled at for making a yep. mistake. It's just it's yeah, the knock on effects mm -hmm. are huge. And do especially you think... when, sorry, no, and especially on. when um, we, we do have staff shortages, especially when there aren't enough hours in the day and there may be one or two people who are more experienced, who are the most appropriate people to ask. Why would you ask somebody with not as much experience? If the person with the experience is there, seek their support. Always seek their support. 
But now if you can't do that because you feel anxious and scared, worried because they've snapped at you and they didn't come back and apologize and say, oh, by the way, I'm really sorry. That had nothing to do with you whatsoever. I'm just really, really pressured. Can I come back to you in five, 10 minutes? I've got time then and I can spend five, 10, 20 minutes with you because they didn't do that. Whatever that work was that you needed help with, it's going to sit. I'm really sorry. I know I've done it and I need to apologize because I know I've done it in the past. Sometimes I feel like people think I've, I've always been this confident character. I haven't. This is such a new thing. I'm so brand new at this. Do you know what? Same. I always used to, whenever I had any kind of conflict or somebody was rude to me, I would cry, burst into tears, couldn't control it. Yeah. I would just burst into tears and I was so embarrassed yeah. <laughs> because I think, oh my God, why can't I, why can't mm-hmm. I you know, handle this? He's just yelling at me. Yeah. And I would sit on it. Even, even now, actually, there was, I remember it vividly and I think I'll carry it with me forever. There was a situation when I lived in London, I was walking along, um, I think it was at St. James's Park. It was like the long cycle path bit. Mm-hmm. And I was walking in the cycle path because I hadn't noticed that it was a cycle path. So I'm walking, sure. walking, walking. And this guy comes up on his bike behind me and he didn't have a bell. He just screamed at me. He screamed, get out of the way. And then he, you know, swore at me. Basically, he used a really horrible expletive at me. and by the time I jumped out of the way and I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't realise. He'd, he'd gone and was still yelling and, and swearing at me as he drove, as he rode off. And I was this left there desperately wanting him, this complete stranger, to understand why I had made that mistake. It, I didn't know. I didn't know it was a mistake. I'm sorry, because that's the sort of person I am. I wouldn't, I'd hate for you to think I was the sort of person who just nonchalantly walked about in cycle lanes. And the, the, there's two things there for me. One, why did I care so much? He's a complete stranger. People make mistakes. You know, it doesn't matter what he thinks. But two, that I'm the sort of person that, that needs people to understand the reason why I've made the mistake or the reason why you know that thing has happened so if I was to ask for help and I was shouted at for it or or spoken to rudely say not necessarily shouting but spoken at rudely I would feel like I just wanted that person to understand and in that moment that's the last thing you can do so Mm -hmm. that feeds that feeling of humiliation and powerlessness and feeling like a child because you can't explain oh I'm really sorry I've just got this thing I need to do it's re- it'll be so quick you know you, you but you can't explain it in that moment no. you just have to turn around and walk away mm-hmm. and it's embarrassing mm-hmm. and those feelings are big shameful powerful emotions mm-hmm. that as an adult you don't expect to feel and I think that's the bottom line for me is with when someone is rude, you're making someone feel big, powerful emotions that as an adult, you don't expect to feel. 100%. 100%. And I think it's that thing, isn't it? When you've been, even though we don't know the word humiliation as children, we don't understand any of that. We just know that, oh, mummy, daddy, a teacher, whomever may have shouted at me. It's that feeling. Like you say, you don't expect to feel it again. And a lot of the times you don't even remember feeling it, but you might see it if you're a parent or a teacher and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I just shouted at my child or that pupil or whomever it is. So you're completely right. As an adult, you don't expect that. And if you have snapped at somebody, we can go back and apologize. There is this problem where people don't realize that apologizing isn't that big a deal. Like we really need to do it. And I say it's not that big a deal because to say sorry is a nice, easy thing to do. But by not doing that nice, easy thing, it makes the situation a hell of a lot worse. But it's worse for everybody because not only have you made somebody feel bad, now that person is scared of you. And if other people have seen you behave like this, they're scared of you. You know, rather than being the nice boss, you're now the horrible boss that people are scared of. And but in your head, you just had a bad day. Yeah, so, you know that's that the thing. Five I think. minutes. It's not exactly. even a day. Exactly. Yeah. You might not even see it, and that's mm-hmm. the scary thing: is that you might be, you might snap, and then it, for a split second, think, 
was that necessary? But actually, you're too busy to worry about it, so you move mm-hmm. on. So you've not even spotted it, and yet the impact it's had. Yeah, it, um, uh, there was a, a, a figure I saw in one of these uh, videos that were, I was watching about incivility that said 98% of NHS staff have experienced incivility. 98%. 98%. You know, and that really, I, I, it's all got to come down to this busyness thing, and hasn't it? That when you're busy, you don't have time to regulate what it is that you're reacting to or how the way that you're reacting but you mentioned there about onlookers you know that if if you're if you happen to be somebody sort of caught in the crossfire of somebody else's rudeness and you see it happen we know that the way that someone has just treated the last person is probably how they're going to treat the next person so you're right you would like keep your head down and think well that's the bully boss but actually, as well, there's a statistic. Onlookers have a 20% reduction in their bandwidth just mm. by watching a heated exchange. This is an amazing statistic. Then if you round the corner of the corridor and someone asks you for help, you're 50% less likely to help them because of what you've just watched. Because what you were you, an Why onlooker. would you want that? Yeah. Why would you want anyone to treat you like that? Oh, right? my God. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I'm not though, like, by that. That's insane. This knock-on effect that we've no. been talking about. You know, and it's you weren't incredible. even the one on the receiving end. It blows my mind. So, yeah. all right, let's get on to how we stop it then. So we've talked we've talked about having this apology that you can, you know, in in the moment it might be heated. You might then afterwards think, oh, shouldn't have spoken like that. You go and you say that wonderful phrase that you just said. You know, I, I can give you five or ten minutes later. You know, I'm so sorry. I'm just very pressured. That's all well and good, but the pressure hasn't stopped. Mm-hmm. So you've you've snapped, you might be sorry about it, but you've got 10 more patients you've got to get on with or you've got that other thing you need to be doing. And actually, by the time you then think about it again, you're at home with your family eating dinner, thinking probably shouldn't have spoken to that person. And it's too Mm -hmm. late by then. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? What's the bigger picture here? Is is it about education? You know, what is incivility? Does everybody Mm. know what it is? Do people need to be more forceful about speaking up when they're on the receiving end of it? Um, Number one it's never too late. So you said by the time you get home and you're sat down having dinner with the family or you're watching TV, whatever it is, you've thought about it again. You're like, ah, I didn't say sorry. That's not too late. Um, You can, I've done it before, um, text someone if you've got their their number. If it's a work thing, a lot of people, we all have like team WhatsApp groups and things like that. Um, Everyone's got an email address. We can email. I will email you next week and apologize for something that happened whenever, you know, reach out. Like there is absolutely nothing to stop anybody reaching out. And yes, that person will feel hurt and they may not trust you because it's really difficult trusting people with your emotions again. And that includes work emotions. Uh, How do we move forward with this? I think it's really interesting because we go with education. Education is the word that we use all the time. How do we educate people about incivilities? How to behave better? Isn't it really weird <laughs> that we have to teach people how to behave? We are grown people and we have to teach each other. But to be honest, it's not about teaching people how to behave. It's about teaching people how we as individuals want to be treated. So the way I may want to be treated may not be the same way as you want to be treated. However, we all want to be treated with respect. Professionally, we have like a behavior framework, for example, uh, NCHNC, and that's the way as an organization we want our workforce to treat each other and this is the environment that we want to work in this is what we're saying and we believe that we will get there by treating people with civility with compassion and with respect and this also goes into the way that we treat our patients so how we treat our staff how we treat each other is the way that it should be fed into our patient care that's the way that we educate people about how we as individuals want to be treated. So we need to understand that respect is over and above everything else and we treat people with decency. Yeah, I agree. I'm just wondering, as you were talking, I was thinking respect goes both ways. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we are asking for respect in how people treat us, we also need to respect sometimes the situation, the people. So let's say we go back. 
you know what I mean? We, we go back to that situation of asking for help. And obviously, mm-hmm. you should always ask for help if you want to. But if the person you're approaching for help has their head buried in some task and their brow is furrowed and they are furiously writing notes, perhaps respect that situation and think, I tell you what, I'm going to come back in five minutes. I'm going to ask them yeah. for help in five minutes time or I'm going to ask somebody else because they look busy not just busy sorry they look engaged they look engaged in a task and you know when you're desperately furiously writing some notes because you want to get it out of your head before you forget and Mm. someone pops over and asks you a question and you know that is more likely to be the moment that you snap at them so you know and I'm not saying that snapping is the right thing to do by any stretch I'm just saying that, that perhaps we should look at it from both sides yes it's just taking a beat isn't it yeah it's that phrase isn't it read the room read the room read the room and I completely agree. You there know. is nothing wrong with writing down whatever it was that you needed so that you don't forget to ask that person. If it is really urgent, try and find somebody else. There is no harm in doing that because maybe other people do know how to help you best at this moment. Don't be scared to ask for help. There are other options. And by asking appropriately, you will be supported. By saying, have you got five minutes later on in the day is not a big deal. And reaching out to anybody else, it's not, it's not that hard. It really mm. isn't. We shouldn't always put our, our eggs all in one basket in those kind of situations. Thank you for listening to Take a Moment with NCHC. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please visit the podcast intranet page to leave a comment and for details of our other episodes. You can also follow NCHC on all social media channels.